Nearly 5,000 years, the scorching sands of the Iraqi desert have held relics of the oldest known civilization, the Sumerian. Our world owes the Sumerians everything. They invented writing and the wheel. They divided time into minutes and seconds. They tamed nature and built gigantic cities. They loved culture and the arts. Their caravans crossed the desert, opening up the first trade routes. Their stories inspired our founding myths, and their memory lives on in the Old Testament. They wrote the history of the birth pangs of mankind. Yet 4,000 years ago, this brilliant civilization died out. For a long time, its very existence remained a mystery. But today, the desert sands are at last yielding some of the secrets of this fascinating civilization. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, and the name of the second river is Gihon, and the name of the third river is Tigris. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden, to dress it and to keep it. In southern Iraq, a crushing silence hangs over the dunes. The temperature is around the 50 degree mark. The climate has not changed for thousands of years. Yet men and women once lived here. Sandwiched between the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf is the region that the Greek historian Polybius called Mesopotamia, the country between two rivers. It was irrigated by the Euphrates and the Tigris. In the mid-19th century, all we knew of ancient Mesopotamia was what we read in the Bible. French and British archaeologists competed to discover more, and their finds were amazing. They uncovered an unsuspected, buried past. Mesopotamia had once been the cradle of a civilization. What was so special about these finds? And why did a civilization develop in that part of the world at all? Ce qui est exceptionnel dans la découverte de la civilisation syro-mésopotamienne, qui ne se fait que depuis un siècle et demi, il faut bien en prendre conscience, ce qui était exceptionnel, c'est que on s'est aperçu progressivement qu'il s'agissait d'un monde extrêmement diversifié, extrêmement développé et qui, au fond, avait expérimenté déjà beaucoup de modes de vie, beaucoup euh, d'expériences sociales euh, dans un, un univers que nous ne connaissions pas. Nous avions l'impression que tout commençait avec la civilisation grecque et on s'est aperçu qu'il y avait eu quelque chose avant et que cet avant avait eu une influence sur le devenir de la, de la civilisation à l'époque classique. L'histoire de la civilisation syro-mésopotamienne euh, correspond au domaine euh, géographique syro-mésopotamien, c'est-à-dire le domaine qui est drainé par les deux fleuves, le Tigre et l'Euphrate. Mais il y, y a autre chose, ce n'est pas simplement l'eau pour la vie, l'eau pour la culture, l'eau pour les hommes, c'est aussi l'eau pour le transport.
Et ce sont des domaines où les axes euh, des fleuves sont devenus des axes de transport. Et dans un pays comme la Mésopotamie, où il y a des productions agricoles, mais où il y a des lacunes fondamentales, on manque de bois, on manque de pierre, on manque euh, des, des, de, de minerais euh, métalliques lorsqu'il y aura besoin en, en bronze, en cuivre, eh bien, dans un pays comme celui-là, le fleuve va devenir l'axe de transport privilégié entre deux domaines d'économie différentes et complémentaires. Our journey begins in the mountains of Armenia, where the Tigris and the Euphrates both rise. Fed by melting snow from the high plateaus, the rivers tumble down the mountain slopes, tearing away tons of silt as they go. They run parallel for over 2,000 kilometers, then merge to form the Shat al-Arab waterway. The rivers are calmer in the wide desert plains to the south. They deposit fertile soil all the way to the Persian Gulf. But the Tigris and the Euphrates could also be a terrible enemy. The spring floods would sweep away everything in their path. How were people able to settle a land that was so vulnerable to the whims of nature? That question takes us to Baghdad, the Iraqi capital on the banks of the Tigris. In the narrow streets of the old city, the visitor is steeped in the scents of the Orient. Dense crowds and a cheerful tumult are all around. In the colorful bazaars, Iraqis display their ancient talent for commerce. The heritage of the Sumerian civilization is everywhere. The markets have sold the same varieties of fruit and vegetables for thousands of years. In the cool of the arcades, you can buy pomegranates from northern Iraq and the yogurt that the Mesopotamians were specially fond of. On street corners, there are earthenware pots of drinking water. The water beads on the surface of the jar and, in evaporating, keeps the water within cool. A Sumerian invention 5,000 years old. But who were the Sumerians? Where did they come from? On the fertile plateaus of Anatolia, several thousand kilometers from Mesopotamia, archaeologists have solved one part of the Sumerian puzzle. They discovered what made it possible for the population to expand and found a civilization. It was Einkorn wheat which grows wild throughout eastern Turkey. People have lived in this fertile region at the crossroads of great migration routes since time immemorial. Tribes of hunter-gatherers found everything here that they needed for their survival. The Kurds keep up the age-old traditions. Every day, the women cook such ekmei a wheat pancake that forms the whole family's staple diet. In 1958, archaeologists discovered the 9,000-year-old ruins of the village of Chayernu. 3,500 years before Sumer, people settled on this fertile land. They didn't yet make ceramics, but they were builders. Their houses had mud-brick walls on dry stone foundations.
One day, the people of Chionyu made a discovery that would change the world. Lorsque se crée vers 15000 avant Jésus-Christ dans ces régions des collines, dans ces régions de l'Euphrate à son entrée en Syrie, lorsque se crée cette situation très particulière qui fait que les collines de ces régions se couvrent de cette graminée sauvage qui va permettre aux hommes de se sédentariser, euh, cet événement, un élément extrêmement nouveau. Quand ils ont découvert que cette graminée produisait euh, une graine qui pouvait être utilisée, qui avait surtout l'énorme avantage de se conserver, la conservation du produit alimentaire a, a joué un rôle euh, essentiel parce que ça voulait dire que, au lieu d'être obligé de retrouver de la nourriture trois jours après avoir abattu une bête, eh bien, on pouvait se dire qu'on en avait pour plusieurs semaines ou plusieurs mois de réserve devant soi, mais à partir de ce moment-là, les conditions changent. Et l'homme, quand il se rend compte qu'il a ce produit, il va rester à côté de ce produit. Bien entendu, ce produit ne se euh, euh, récolte qu'à un moment très précis de l'année, mais on ne peut pas le transporter. Une fois qu'on l'a récolté, il faut le garder, dans un, c'est un stock. Il faut le protéger, ce stock, il faut empêcher les autres de venir euh, le, le, le prendre. Donc, la sédentarisation euh, se fait à, à, à un moment donné, dans cette région-là, pour une raison très, très, très précise, c'est-à-dire la conservation d'un stock alimentaire que l'on peut récolter à un certain moment. Et là, bien entendu, l'esprit humain va jouer un rôle fondamental. Euh, on peut parler de découverte accidentelle. Je crois que l'esprit humain, euh, il joue constamment sur euh, des observations, sur des découvertes exceptionnelles, une fois, deux fois, répétées, sur une recherche d'explication de ce phénomène, jusqu'au moment où il est capable, par lui-même, d'aller au-delà et de réaliser quelque chose de nouveau. Et c'est comme ça qu'est née l'agriculture. As they set about mastering their environment, these first farmers were full of invention. They developed their tools, they bettered their daily lives, and they left behind a legacy of immense importance, writing. Cereals were the main source of wealth for the Sumerian civilization. This alabaster vase, more than a meter high, depicts the Sumerians' gratitude towards nature. It also expresses their religious fervor. The vegetable and animal worlds are represented as ears of wheat and herds of sheep. A procession of men bearing offerings approaches the sanctuary of Inanna, the goddess of heaven and earth. The pilgrims are welcomed by the high priest in his robes. Thanks to these successes in agriculture, the population grew. The first groups began to colonize land along the rivers all the way to the great plain of Mesopotamia. The main preoccupation of the farmers was finding ways to boost their production of crops. This clay tablet shows a device for more economical sowing. The seeds are deposited via a funnel that ensures regular, even distribution in the furrows. The Sumerian secret lay in taming their unpredictable sources of water. For in Mesopotamia, the balance between man and nature could easily tip against man. To take control of their water, the Sumerians invented the wheel, and they dug hundreds of kilometers of irrigation canals reservoirs and dams. Irrigation was the mainstay of the Sumerian civilization. By subduing the turbulent waters of the Tigris and the Euphrates, they turned the power of nature to their own use.
the farmers reap the benefits with bountiful crops from hundreds of thousands of hectares of fertilized land. In some areas, wheat, millet and barley were harvested twice a year. In the oases along the irrigation canals, millions of palm trees grew as far as the eye could see. It's the same when the Tigris and the Euphrates merge to form a single body of water, the Shat al-Arab waterway. On each side of the Shat al-Arab, an agricultural province prospers thanks to the bountiful water from the two great rivers. Only barges can reach the heart of this maze of tall reeds. The Sumerians built fishing villages here. The people still live as their ancestors did. They still build reed huts, just like the ones seen in ancient bas-reliefs. The huts stand on a foundation of layers of soil, interlaced with braided reeds. The floor, roof and walls are made of interwoven stalks. The supporting columns and beams, very strong, are made of tightly packed reed bundles. Five thousand years ago, 40,000 fishermen and farmers, an entire people, lived in the marshland around the port city of Ur. In their frail reed boats, they had made a huge area habitable, one meter at a time. And they said one to another, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. The first archaeologists to see the ruins of Ur must have been speechless. Before them lay narrow streets, squares, and the remains of houses, granaries, and temples. Five thousand years ago, when Western Europe was still in the Stone Age, this was a city of 34,000 people. When they built cities like Ur, the Mesopotamians were shaping the world in their own image. La transformation du monde, de l'environnement, par les habitants de la Mésopotamie, est un phénomène fondamental. Ils ne se sont pas simplement contentés de créer des villages, ils ont implanté des zones de culture. Par la suite, à l'époque des villes, ils ne se sont pas contentés de laisser pousser des villes, ils ont aménagé la région. Et le mode de vie qu'ils ont développé était un mode de vie de domination de la nature. Et ça, c'est quelque chose de tout à fait étonnant, qu'on ne pense pas toujours. Ils ont dominé leur nature pour arriver à la mettre au service de leur survie. Made to last, with fired bricks covered in tar, the ziggurat of Ur is impressive. It's estimated that it took 1,500 men five years just to build its base. Farmers up to 20 kilometers away could see the house of their god. Drawings done by the British archaeologist Leonard Woolley in the early 20th century help us imagine what Ur looked like 4,000 years ago. This immense city was surrounded by 4,000 hectares of cereal fields. Traders from the Persian Gulf sailed into its harbor and exported food to the Arabian Peninsula, several thousand kilometers away. The daily life of the city centered on the temple, where the people prayed and political and economic decisions were taken. Behind an eight-meter-high city wall, the houses were haphazardly piled up. The streets were narrow, winding, and unsewered. 
garbage was burnt outside the house when it wasn't simply left on the road. Three-story buildings jostled with single-story ones, and none of the houses was aligned with its neighbors. Their facades had no openings, just low doors and a few air vents in order to keep the interior cool and to keep the dust clouds out. For a long time, little was known of life in Ur. Leonard Woolley had spent years excavating the ruins when, in 1926, he discovered what was dubbed the Death Pit. It was the tomb of Queen Puabi and of more than 20 servants and soldiers who were sacrificed and buried with her in order to serve her in the afterlife. Among the skeletons covered in gold and silver, Woolley found this, the so-called Standard of Ur. Its mother-of-pearl figures show Sumerian fishermen, slaves and soldiers walking for eternity against a sky of lapis lazuli. Like stills from a movie, its amazingly detailed panels show war chariots crushing the enemy. or the frozen smile of a scribe having a drink with friends. In the arid desert that now surrounds the site, the traces of the past are still visible. When they found the ruins of Sumerian dams on this barren land, several kilometers from the rivers, 19th century archaeologists faced an enigma. How had people lived in this desert, so far from the source of water? The desert city of Nippur, 250 kilometers south of Baghdad. The ruins of a temple rise above the dunes. It was during excavations of this site that archaeologists found the key to the enigma. This clay tablet is a map of Nippur. It shows the exact locations of the temple and the city wall. The Euphrates ran to the west of the wall it had been diverted to supply the city with water. The cities had therefore been built beside the water. But changes in landform and the sheer force of the floodwaters changed the course of the rivers. Satellite images help us reconstruct the map of this part of the world as it was 5,000 years ago. Nippur, Uruk, Gisu and Ur, the main cities of the Sumerian civilization, evolved in a vastly different landscape. At that time, the Tigris and the Euphrates ran through much of Mesopotamia as a single river. They separated only downstream from Nippur. Sunrise over ancient Ur. It is midsummer and the day will be scorchingly hot. Slowly the city comes to life. People slept on their rooftops, which were much cooler at night than the small rooms of their houses. Ancient texts listing real estate sales show that the house's floor space was less than 70 square meters. In the early morning, people come onto the streets. Merchants try to entice the passers-by. They try to do business while the day is still cool.
In the courtyards of some houses, men relax and drink beer through straws. Several ancient texts refer to the Sumerian temperament. The Sumerians' exposure to the hazards of nature made them conscious of the brevity and fragility of life. In the streets, men often wear konaks, wrap-around sheepskin skirts that go from the waist to the knees or ankles, depending on the season and fashion. The wives of dignitaries wear colorful, lighter garments. Both men and women wear jewelry, earrings, bracelets, and necklaces. Archaeologists have discovered that forgers operating in the walled city could replicate gold and turquoise. People who couldn't afford real jewelry could buy and wear fancy fakes. This neighborhood was home to merchants, shopkeepers, and traders. The homes of the scribes, masons, and carpenters, and the slaves' houses were all within a short distance of the temple. The treasures discovered in Ur are enormously important for archaeologists. They reveal Sumerian customs, and they demonstrate the quality of the craftsman's work. Sumerian goldsmiths had mastered the techniques of chiseling and soldering gold. The bull's head on this harp has eyes of lapis lazuli turned towards eternity. The harp itself is decorated with shells and precious stones. For their last journey with their queen, the servants wore a spectacular diadem of gold bands and precious stones. A braiding of beech leaves covered the brow, and above the head rose three golden flowers. The gold, used also in cups and ceremonial weapons, as well as the lapis lazuli and turquoise, all came from the east. The mother of pearl and the shells came from Bahrain. The raw material used to make this billy goat shows how prosperous Ur was and how thriving its trade. Archaeologists have traced the origins of some of its materials. To get the lapis lazuli, the Sumerians sent their caravans 3,000 kilometers to the Badakhstan mountains in what is now northern Pakistan. Peshawar, the merchant city in northern Pakistan. This rough lapis lazuli has been shipped from Afghanistan. Splashing water on the stones brings out the intense blue that fascinated the Sumerians. Archaeologists have established that the lapis lazuli trade began with the Sumerian civilization 3,500 years before Christ. 3,000 years before the Silk Road, the Sumerians had opened up the trade routes that crisscrossed the east. With the development of trade, the Sumerians invented the concept of the contract. Cylindrical stone seals were carved and finally engraved with a negative bas-relief. When a contract was entered into, or goods needed to be identified, the cylinder was rolled in clay. The market left on the clay sealed the transaction.
That was also how the Sumerians, who held contracts in great esteem, began to make laws. Very few legal texts from the Sumerian period have been found, but in the early 20th century, in the Persian city of Susa, archaeologists discovered the stone of Hammurabi, king of Babylon. It had been seized as a trophy by the Elamites, who went on a rampage through Mesopotamia in the 12th century BC. Hammurabi had the legal code that bears his name drawn up in 1694 BC. It enshrined all of Sumeria's laws, and all 282 articles were carved on the stone. They mostly relate to aspects of everyday life, to commercial transactions, marriages, and inheritances. As a judge, the king ordered investigations, protected the people from abuse by officials, and oversaw great public works. The code of Hammurabi proves that the Sumerians were precursors in many areas. On the back of the stone, Article 196 warns, an eye for an eye a principle repeated in the Law of Moses. To build their Garden of Eden, the Sumerians roamed the world in search of commodities they lacked. For example, there was no wood in the Mesopotamian desert. To get this rare commodity, which they used exclusively as a building material, the Sumerians ventured to Syria, Turkey, and the mountains of Lebanon. Today, cedar forests are few and far between. After the Sumerians, all the ancient civilizations used cedar, and gradually they cut down almost all the cedar trees. Legend has it that some cedars are over 4,000 years old and grew in civilizations now vanished. They could testify to the efforts of the Sumerians. Bar reliefs found in temples show Sumerian loggers felling 100-year-old cedars and loading them onto their ships before sailing down the Euphrates. These expeditions lasted several months and show the enormous achievement of a people living in a hostile environment. Some discoveries made by the Sumerians 5,000 years ago are still used by Iraqis today. Tar, for instance, is used for waterproofing boat hulls and sealing the roofs of houses. This is Hait, a small town on the banks of the Euphrates, 600 kilometers from the Sumerian cities. Tar and sulfur erupt from the earth here. Tar floats, and archaeologists believe the Sumerians could have collected tar from the river banks as it floated down the Euphrates. The people of Haight still collect tar by methods that haven't changed for thousands of years. Before taking the tar out of the water, 
you have to coat your hands in sand. The Sumerians, too, used tar for waterproofing boats, but they mainly used it for sealing bricks and for waterproofing the foundations of public buildings. This precaution reflected a major event in their lives, floods. George Smith, a 19th century Londoner who studied Sumerian tablets in the British Museum, deciphered some legends about devastating floods. The wickedness of men so displeased Enlil, the supreme god, that he decided to swallow man up in a huge flood. Enki, protector of men, pleaded with him, but in vain. So Enki decided to preserve a remnant. He asked Zusudra to build an ark and to take animals in pairs on board with him. After six days and nights of storm, the world was submerged. On the seventh day, the storm abated. Zusudra released a dove that, finding no resting place, returned to him. On the eighth day, he released a raven that never returned. Mankind was saved. Nous n'avons retrouvé les mythes mésopotamiens que depuis un peu plus d'un siècle dans les textes qui ont été trouvés, en particulier dans la bibliothèque de Ninive, en particulier le déluge. Mais en réalité, toute la civilisation occidentale, tout le christianisme occidental est imbibé du texte biblique. Et dans le texte biblique, il y a des mythes qui viennent directement du monde mésopotamien. Et toute l'histoire du christianisme occidental est dominée par ces mythes, compris ou pas compris, réinterprétés bien souvent, pas sentis peut-être dans le, la signification profonde que leur accordaient les, les, les habitants de la Mésopotamie. Mais ces mythes sont là et ils nous ont complètement imprégnés. The gods instilled fear and respect. They symbolized the Sumerians' mistrust of nature. Each divinity in their pantheon played a role. Each one ruled over a city. Enlil, god of wind, ruled over air and earth in the city of Nippur. Enki, god of water and the world, was worshipped in Eridu. Udu, god of justice and truth, was worshipped in Lhasa. Inanna, known to the Babylonians as the fertility goddess Ishtar, was worshipped in Uruk. She inspired both love and war. To the Greeks, she was Aphrodite, and to the Romans, Venus. The smooth curves of this alabaster statue reflect the skill of the Sumerian artists. Their art and their religious devotion are highlighted by the statue's finish and their expressive faces. Le sentiment religieux des Mésopotamiens c'est quelque chose qui est bien difficile à saisir. Nous trouvons dans les fouilles des temples. Nous avons par les textes euh, des mythes, nous avons des rituels, c'est-à-dire euh, ce qu'il faut accomplir lors de telle ou telle cérémonie. Mais le sentiment profond est très mal connu et très mal exprimé. Euh, il y a dans l'univers mésopotamien un concept 
cette euh, très générale de puissance divine. Il y a des forces, et l'homme est au service de ces forces, et il doit euh, euh, dire, faire avec elles, il doit composer avec elles. Cette religion est une religion euh, de, de l'homme au service du Dieu. Ce service, c'est quoi C'est assurer son existence au quotidien, c'est lui donner à manger, lui donner à boire au cours des repas de chaque journée, c'est de le vêtir avec des beaux vêtements, alors il s'agit évidemment de sa statue, de mettre des colliers, de les enlever, de changer selon les jours. De temps en temps, on sort le Dieu dans des grandes fêtes, on le promène à travers la ville, il va faire des séjours ailleurs, puis il revient dans son temple. Si nous regardons les faits tels que nous les connaissons, la religion mésopotamienne, c'est à peu près ça. Prayer was part of daily life for the Sumerians. The upkeep and ceremonies of the temple required a large body of priests and other staff. And every day, the faithful brought their offerings. The archives of the city of Uruk describe the daily meal of its four main gods as follows. 250 loaves of bread, a thousand tarts, fifty sheep, eight lambs, two oxen, and one calf. Celestial food that was offered to the gods and later fed the temple's 1,200 priests and staff. The scribes recorded the hopes of the Sumerians. In exchange for their devotion, their virtue, and their respect for the established order, the Sumerians hoped for eternal life in the next world. The never-ending struggle to tame nature made them conscious of the fragility of life and inspired their most beautiful myths. Gilgamesh, the fifth king of Uruk in the third millennium BC, was a historical figure. He was the Sumerian's hero and the stories of his adventures were famous throughout Mesopotamia. They sum up the history of the Sumerian civilization. Gilgamesh was a just king and a great builder who also challenged the gods. He tamed savages and he went to the distant forest of fragrant cedar to confront the fire-eating monster Humbaba. During their fight, Gilgamesh cut off the monster's head. He returned to Uruk in triumph. To punish him, the goddess Inanna sent the celestial bull to destroy the city. The bull dried up the meadows and rivers and opened deep crevices into which people fell to their deaths. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. The Sumerians' vision was prophetic. After ruling Mesopotamia for 3,000 years, their civilization, attacked from all sides, collapsed. The pomp of their cities was over, and so was their influence. The irrigation canals gradually dried up. The walls of the houses collapsed. The temples themselves collapsed under the combined assault of the sun, the rain, and the wind. The clay of the bricks turned to dust, leaving only a shapeless mass above the dunes, the last vestiges of a civilization's grandeur. How can we explain the complete disappearance of such a brilliant civilization, or the decadence of a people who left behind only ruins and the remains of looted temples? Est-ce qu'on peut parler d'un déclin? Dans une certaine mesure, oui, mais peut-être plutôt d'une sclérose. Toutes ces grandes découvertes réalisées par euh, les gens de, euh, du quatrième millénaire, toute la pensée qui se concrétise 
par des manifestations religieuses, ou disons dans le cadre du religieux. Toutes ces choses-là euh, évoluent. Et, euh, vu à longue échelle, on s'aperçoit qu'il y a de moins en moins de liberté possible dans l'expression d'un certain nombre de choses. Par exemple, euh, l'art euh, mésopotamien est infiniment plus divers, plus florissant au troisième millénaire qu'au premier millénaire. Qu'est-ce qui se passe vers 1200 Vers 1200, c'est la découverte du fer. Le fer est un atout, le fer est quelque chose de plus efficace que le cuivre, et par certains côtés plus facile à travailler, même s'il faut une température plus forte, à, à des euh, applications encore plus nombreuses. Donc c'est une amélioration, mais l'environnement de la Mésopotamie n'est pas riche en fer. Et le problème des sources va se poser parce qu'il faut aller beaucoup plus loin, et par conséquent, les régions qui ont du, du minerai de fer vont jouer un rôle beaucoup plus fort que la Mésopotamie. For almost a century, in the tablets archived in the temples, scribes patiently recorded the decline of crop yields. From 2350 BC, wheat production fell by 40%. Only barley production remained stable. How could a people who had developed such advanced techniques be powerless to keep their resources from dwindling? For decades, archaeologists pored over texts for an answer, but the answer lay in the field. The irrigation system made the Sumerians powerful, but it also contributed to their destruction. As 3,000 years of irrigation water evaporated, the salt, buried deep in the land, rose to the surface. In the end, a white cover of salt, hardened by the sun, made the soil sterile and the wheat could no longer grow. The local people are still plagued by this problem today. In some areas, the earth is cracked. It resembles uncultivated desert. This is what the great fields around the cities look like. Faced with climate change and desertification, Sumerian farmers could find no solution. Can one speak of the decline of a civilization? Parler d'un déclin n'est pas correct. C'est une puissance qui, euh, qui s'est développée et une civilisation qui est arrivée euh, à, au fond à son terme en donnant des produits superbes. Et alors ces produits, cette pensée, elle ne va pas périr. C'est une pensée qui va être transmise. Les, les, les Grecs, les Perses, euh, qui sont eux-mêmes des gens très, très cultivés, comme, comme les gens de la Mésopotamie de l'époque, enfin certaines catégories, certaines élites, vont transmettre cette, ces, leur science, transmettre leur savoir. Et ceci va se faire en particulier par l'Anatolie, en direction du monde grec. Et par le monde grec, ça va se retrouver dans la Méditerranée. Et tout le bassin méditerranéen va hériter de cette civilisation mésopotamienne, mais sans pouvoir faire une référence absolue à, aux formes même de cette civilisation The weakened Sumerian cities were unable to face the economic competition from the large cities to the north of Mesopotamia. Other civilizations, inspired by the Sumerian example, planted their standards on the conquered land. By 2004 BC, Sumer was finished. The Assyrians dominated Mesopotamia. The epic of Babylon could now begin. Beneath the pitiless sun, the Sumerians' wealth returned to the dust. It's their story that the Bible tells. Like the builders of the Tower of Babel, the men and women of Sumer 
were scattered upon the face of all the earth. The water the Sumerians feared brought on their destruction. Having controlled the floods of the Tigris and the Euphrates, having drawn their life force from their waters, the Sumerians were swept away by history and disappeared. They left mankind the legacy of their wealth, traces of their creative genius, and a sense of the extraordinary fragility of civilizations.